So um, today's topic is going to be uh, about immunotherapy for IVF. Uh, and we are um, going to be talking about the various immunotherapies in a new study where they did a comparison with something called network meta-analysis, which allows you to um, use meta-analysis model to compare different types of uh, treatments amongst each other. Um, so kind of a new uh, process, a new study, um, because it has not been done in the same fashion before. Um, a lot of data, a lot of really interesting stuff, and some very robust numbers, which I have not seen before. So this is kind of interesting for me, um, because some of these things we don't routinely do, but it looks like they may have some significant benefits. So I hope you are all well. Um, I will briefly touch on a topic that people asked us to talk about last week, which was naltrexone for um, fertility. So um, there are very, very few studies of naltrexone for infertility. And uh, most of those studies involve um, doing things like um, uh, PCOS patients and ovulation and so on. So uh, in that scenario, um, none of the uh, um, studies said anything negative. They actually all suggested that naltrexone was beneficial. But there is nothing for naltrexone and IVF. Um, it's only for patients that are doing um, treatment specifically for PCOS and nothing else. Tarek is behind me <laughs> trying to make this work. <laughs> this is absolutely hilarious. Welcome to the modern age of the internet. Um, in any event, um, so what we're going to talk about today is this study. Um, and this was interesting. So uh, this group essentially pulled together a huge number of studies, but they limited it to um, randomized control trials that were involving uh, different types of immunotherapy for patients with recurrent implantation failure. Uh, and um, they started out with over 22,000 articles, which just goes to show how you know, significant a, a problem this is and significant an issue this is. And the uh, fact that um, you were totally on camera the whole time. <laughs> um, and it basically shows everyone, uh, you know, what, what the uh, um, number of trials that they needed to limit it to was. So they ended up with 21 trials at the end of it all. Um, and at the uh, uh, outset of that, they analyzed it and then did comparisons. Um, so just to kind of go through the basics, um, there is a whole school of thought in, in vitro fertilization uh, and fertility that says that the immune system is critically important to success. And there are journals dedicated to this, the Journal of Reproductive Immunology. Um, so there are whole divisions of our science devoted to figuring out how the immune system interacts and how we can modulate it to make it more tolerant of embryo implantation. And then a whole other question of, should we make it more tolerant of embryo implantation? Um, so along the lines of this, pretty much everything in the kitchen sink has been tried to help people with IVF failures. Um, and the first question is, well, what constitutes recurrent implantation failure? So there actually is not a solid, convincing, single definition. Some people will say three embryo transfers. Some people will say three euploid embryo transfers. Other people will say an entire IVF cycle. What probably makes the most sense is that it be some number of known genetically normal embryos um, or some other number if you don't know if they're genetically normal because the normalcy is a whole other argument um, and whether or not we should do PGTA. But basically, we're probably looking at some type of definition. So for this particular study, um, they were a little less specific. They said the inclusion criteria were that it had to be randomized controlled trials, which is good because that's what we really want. It had to be uh, recurrent implantation failures with at least one or more in vitro fertilization embryo transfer failure histories. Uh, and then they had to have some kind of immunotherapy and they had to report on the clinical outcome. I can cancel that. Yeah. Uh, because now we're up and running. You're up and running. Backwards. I think you got to go down there. You want me to do it? You're backwards. <laughs> okay. So we're back on Facebook now. 
Um, so uh, essentially what they looked at was uh, either clinical pregnancy. So they saw, um, they called that uh, defined as evidence of a gestational sac on transvaginal ultrasound, whereas clinical pregnancy is actually a fetal heartbeat. Um, and then they had secondary outcome measures, which were the implantation rate, the live birth rate, and miscarriage rate. So right from the get-go, there are some issues we got to look at here, which is the fact that their definition of clinical pregnancy rate is not what everybody else uses, number one. And number two, they use live birth rate as a secondary outcome, whereas live birth rate really should be your primary outcome. So interesting to look at, but nevertheless uh, worthy of, of further analysis. So they started out with 22,855 articles. Um, 99 of those they looked at uh, after screening. 25 studies extra they found through doing additional analysis. And so they finally ended up from all of those with 21 uh, randomized controlled trials that met their criteria and they said these are good. So um, the first thing they analyzed was the primary outcome, which was clinical pregnancy rate. So they looked at nine different treatments. Um, all immunotherapies uh, had at least one placebo controlled trial. So these are trials where they randomly assign women to either getting a placebo or the medication. And none of them involved comparing one immune treatment to another immune treatment. It was immune treatment to placebo. Um, so they didn't necessarily compare those ones together. So when they looked at peripheral blood mononuclear cells, which is where you can fractionate the different groups of cells, and that's what was in our picture on our ad for this show, um, they demonstrated that that actually increased your success by 163%, highly significant. Granulocyte colony stimulating factor, 103%. Intralipids, which are cheap and easy to use and don't cost a fortune, 98%. Um, PRP, 155%, that's platelet-rich plasma. And then this drug called serolimus was 295% higher than normal. So that one seemed to have a huge impact. Um, and it works through this very specific pathway called mTOR, um, T-O-R, and it uh, counteracts something called rapamycin. So it's an interesting drug. Um, it does have significant anti-rejection properties when you're doing uh, transplants and so on. So it's a very reasonable thing to consider when you're doing IVF because the whole theory is that your immune system may reject an embryo because the embryo is only going to be half you, if at all you. And so uh, we need to kind of allow it to adapt to your immune system. Um, so when they looked at it in terms of uh, going into other um, analyses, when they compared it to a different baseline, um, they actually had even more robust responses. So 533% for the PMDCs, um, granulocyte colony, colony stimulating factor was 389%. Um, even HCG had a huge increase in success. That was 384%, intralipids 377%, PRP was 515%, and then serolimus, which I'm definitely going to try, 809% uh, increase. I mean, stratospheric numbers, very, very, very significant. Um, when they looked at clinical pregnancy rate, um, they basically did some probability analysis to see how significant these things are. And they said the serolimus was number one, then the PBMCs, the PRP, the GCSF, and then intralipids last. Um, so we do use quite a lot of intralipids. These other things are way more rare and way, way more costly um, and require drawing blood for at least two of them, which are the PBMCs and the PRP. But serolimus, we need to look into because if it's not expensive, that may be a very easy, simple way of helping people out. So um, we're going to have to do some serolimus uh, evaluation um, very soon. So basically, when they did all of this, they said that there was very good consistency with the results of the network meta-analysis. They were very happy um, with the results and basically said that all of this looked really good. So then they started doing subgroup analysis. And they said, what if we actually take women that have more than three failures so that it's not just one failure, it's several failures, which obviously is a lot of the patients out there because most people are not diving into immune therapy after just one failure. 
So when they did that, they said that the PBMCs, the peripheral blood mononuclear, mononuclear cells, had a 201% increase. The GCSF had a 120% increase. PRP was still a huge increase, 286%. And again, serolimus was 295%, kind of dwarfing all the others. All of them very, very successful. Um, they did say that the PRP was better than the intralipids. Um, they kind of went into detail with that. So they said that it looked like when you did the probability, PRP actually had um, quite a, a strong impact when they did the probability assessment, even stronger in the probability assessment than the serolimus. So PRP is platelet-rich plasma. This is where we can extract the um, uh, platelet-rich portion of your plasma, um, kind of compact it in a centrifuge, and then take that and inject it into the uterus. So they are suggesting that for patients with recurrent implantation failure, the PRP has a very, very significant uh, impact if you've had more than three failures. So that's huge. They then went even further and they said, what about looking at frozen embryo transfers, which we do quite a bit of mostly. Um, and so they looked at nine different uh, studies that involved that um, using five different treatments. So the PBMCs, 156% improvement, PRP, 148%. Um, those were quite significant. The other ones did not show significance. So in the frozen embryo transfers, they were really looking at these blood product approaches to things. There was not one for the serolimus, although I do think it looks like it's very worthwhile. When they looked at secondary outcomes, so all of the other things that they were evaluating, <clears throat> they said that the live birth rate, um, the PBMCs and serolimus were actually the ones that showed a difference in live birth rate. And since that's the real holy grail, that's the one we should really be focusing on, less so than the clinical pregnancy rate. So serolimus, again, seems to be this like wonder drug that we really do need to take a look at. Um, they did mention as well that uh, the other ones also helped, but not quite as much. Um, including intralipids, which with our experience, we use frequently because we've seen improvements. Miscarriage rate actually was not um, affected by any of the drugs that were used. Um, so in sum, uh, essentially when they went through all of this, they're finding that there are immune modulations that can be done that will help with the outcome of your treatment if you are uh, having immune-based problems or recurrent failures. Um, a lot of the patients I talk to these days are coming to us from the web, and they're from all over the world, frequently Australia, Europe, um, the UK, where they've tried many, many, many times. In particular, Australia I had one patient I spoke to just the other night who had tried nine previous cycles, um, and they're having failures. And those patients are patients that almost undoubtedly have some component of immune problem, because realistically, if you're putting in genetically normal embryos, um, as we've talked about on the show before, there's a very good study by Richard Scott's team that shows that 95.2% of patients will succeed after three euploid embryo transfers. So if you're failing after three euploid embryo transfers, something undoubtedly is wrong and needs to be very carefully looked at. And this may be a big part of what that is. So what sort of things can we use? It looks like the PBMC transfusion or, or injection, PRP injections, intralipids, um, serolimus, all of these do appear to have pretty strong evidence because they're coming from randomized controlled trials that they could be potentially beneficial. I definitely will try the serolimus shortly. We just have to see how much that stuff costs. I don't know if you have time to look that up while we're discussing this, but it's S-I-R-O-L-I-M-U-S. See if you can find a cost for that. I'd be very, very interested to know. Uh, so is it a fact or fiction that immune therapies um, can impact things? It is fact. It does appear that immune therapies can have a huge impact. And are those uh, things that we can modify for you? Yeah, they are. Um, which ones seem to work? Um, it seems like serolimus and PRP and PBMCs have the strongest impact, but intralipids also seems to have a, an impact, and even HCG therapy seems to have an impact. You find anything? How much do I want to know? <laughs> Pack of 30, average cost for 30 tablets. So yeah. About 111 bucks. Well, that's not bad. I mean, compared to what people are paying for this yes. stuff, that's like completely reasonable.
Okay, so um, my uh, Apple Watch is telling me that the battery is dead. So you know what? Um, we're going to go to live questions now. So uh, thank you for watching that part of the show. Um, we love uh, taking care of that. Make sure you uh, comment. Make sure you share. And make sure you uh, um, subscribe, um, in particular on our YouTube channel, which seems to grow no matter what we do. And please, yourselves and your friends, share and uh, comment and like. And subscribe to uh, Instagram, Facebook, and so on. We, uh, we're always happy to grow. Uh, so uh, let's take the questions. From Facebook. Okay. For vaginal suppositories, should I aim to place them as deep as possible to ensure the medicine, medicine gets absorbed and doesn't leak no. out? And do you recommend sex before or after their placements? Um, I would definitely recommend sex before the placement of your suppositories. Otherwise, your partner is absorbing a lot of progesterone. Um, so that's probably not a great idea. Um, and it does not have to go very high. The vaginal blood supply is kind of uniform throughout the vagina. So anywhere in you that you place it, it'll get absorbed and get to your, your bloodstream and your uterus. So you don't have to worry about that. Interesting question. Okay. What is the best surgery for large and so many fibroids? The best surgery for large and you need a myomectomy. So you should have the fibroids removed. Um, it has to be done by an expert that really knows what they're doing. Um, whether they do it laparoscopically or open is debatable. I do mine open um, because I just make a tiny little incision and I can do it through that usually. Um, some people believe in doing it laparoscopically. If you're doing it laparoscopically, almost always you do need a robot. And I'm not a fan of robots for surgery, but you almost always do need a robot because um, it's very difficult to stitch the uterus back together well, unless you've got a robot which can kind of manipulate the uterus and get you the angles you need. Um, robots can actually manipulate into angles that even human hands can't. So um, that's a, an advantage, but then you have to morselate to get it out. And most people are very gun shy about morselation um, after all the hoopla about spreading cancer from sarcomas inside of women. So um, I would be cautious on that one so we normally go open, but open or laparoscopic, um, both would be completely acceptable. I usually go open. You usually go open. <laughs> um, if you had mild uh, adenomyosis, yeah. do you have Lupron and Letrozole before transferring an embryo? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there's no evidence for that, but it just makes very logical sense. Adenomyosis like endo, um, is very estrogen sensitive. So the combo of the Lupron and the Letrozole shuts you down better than Lupron alone. So yes, we use both. You're, uh, I, I think Facebook came back online just for the show, just to put it out there. <laughs> you, you got a lot already. All right. Um, how do you have these questions? Yeah. Okay. What are the tests you recommend for someone with higher rate of abnormals at younger age with endo and DOR? What kind of tests do I think they should do? Mm. Vitamin levels, your AMH, your FSH, prolactin, um, thyroid, thyroid antibodies. Um, I mean, if you're... If you have DOR, you should consider doing pre-implantation genetic testing of the embryos um, because your risk of having aneuploid or genetically not normal embryos is higher. I'm not sure I'm answering your question because I'm not sure I fully understand that question, but hopefully that answered it. If not, um, ask again, maybe uh, just clarify what you're asking for. But those are the tests we would normally do. And then, of course, we would test your partner as well because no matter what you're like, he's half the equation. So... Uh, interesting. I spoke to a, an Australian couple, as I mentioned earlier, on the weekend. Um, they were told that their the male's contribution to the embryo was negligible if the embryo was genetically normal. Um, I literally have no idea how someone could ever justify calling themselves knowledgeable in fertility if they said that. It's half the genetic material. It's half of the embryo quality. Um, you cannot by any means say that the male is out of the equation just because you've made a genetically normal embryo. So um, you always need to test both parts. It's not just the women um, that are important here. It's the men and the women, for sure. 
Tarek knew that. <laughs> What's your opinion on using a fetal Doppler to monitor baby movements? Um, okay, so fetal Dopplers are not used to monitor baby movements. They're used to monitor fetal heartbeat. Um, so uh, I think it's absolutely maniacal. Do not do it. It will drive you crazy because without our experience or our skill, you'll actually have a hard time finding it, especially early in the pregnancy. And then every five seconds, you'll be in triage or emerge wondering if everything's okay. Um, it has not been ever shown to provide any benefit. Um, and it tends to just drive people crazy. So we are staunchly against it. In fact, way back in the beginning, when we started, we were going to buy a bunch and kind of rent them out to people. And we immediately decided not to, because it's just totally useless. So please don't do that. It's not needed or beneficial. So two days ago, you were asked a question on YouTube regarding your PRP video. Okay. Okay. And now we'll follow up with another one on, on Instagram. Is What is your opinion on PRP now? Yeah. So um, there's two branches of PRP. There's PRP in the uterus and there's PRP in the ovary. So PRP in the uterus does seem to be beneficial and there are trials which have supported that. So doing PRP into the uterus is likely beneficial. This study we just reviewed tonight suggests that it's quite beneficial. Um, in particular, if you have recurrent implantation failure or a thin lining. So in those cases, I totally think it's worth giving it a shot. Um, it's pricey, but hopefully you can find somewhere they're not going to gouge you for it. And then it's not so bad. Um, PRP into the ovary, which is something that was kind of pioneered, I think, in Greece, um, has not yet been tested rigorously to demonstrate a benefit. There's only one study at all worth looking at. That's one done by Richard Scott, and it was published, I think, last summer, um, where they showed somewhere between an 8 to 11 percent in uh, live birth rate. That's a really low live birth rate. The question then becomes, what are you going to achieve if you don't do PRP? Would you still get an 8 to 11% live birth rate? The other part of it is, um, you know, how useful is that? Like, you know, if I'm talking to patients and I tell them you have an 8% chance, um, some people will go for it. But then the cost is astronomical and they weren't trying just once. This is like multiple tries at IVF. So, you know, if you're in the States, you're insured, you're not paying for your IVF, yes, absolutely, it's worth giving it a shot. But if you're somewhere else and you don't have insurance coverage for this, I would be very, very reluctant to be telling you to do something multiple times that's going to yield an 8% chance of success. Um, would I do it for you? Yes. Am I going to try it? Probably. But am I going to recommend this routinely to people? No, because it just isn't there yet. Now, if they come out with a randomized controlled trial and that supports it, sure, then I would support it too, but not until we have better data than what's currently available. So PRP in the uterus, great. PRP into your ovary for those of you with very diminished ovarian reserve um, might be beneficial, might not. We don't know. Hey, Dr. V, just joining after finishing an at-home workout class. Oh, awesome. I just did yoga with our team. You should have been there, man. You failed me. I, you should have come. I, I got to plan for that. Try the schedule. I gotta, I gotta, it was pretty fun. Way to go, Team VRC. My whole team came out, and um, it was great. We all did yoga together. Um, I actually fell asleep at one part. <laughs> I did. We were doing shavasa. I was like, okay, I'm gone. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, I woke myself up snoring. <laughs> good way to go. Yeah. Go for it. Doesn't matter what time of day you take baby aspirin. Does it have any benefit besides if you have clotting issues? Yeah. Uh, reduces preterm labor, improves success rate, improves blood flow, improves oxygenation, decreases inflammation. So there's a whole slew of benefits. Um, reduces preeclampsia. Uh, so there's a whole slew of aspirin ben benefits. The time of day makes no difference whatsoever. Uh, do you need good embryo quality for interlipid infusion? Uh, you need good embryo quality, period. Interlipid infusion will just calm your immune system. If you have a bad embryo and you're using interlipids, it's not going to save this circumstance. 
Intralipids is to target your immune system so that it quiets down so it doesn't attack your embryo. But a bad embryo is still going to be a bad embryo, regardless of what immune stuff you do to it. Um, I'm curious if you have any comments on diet specifically, do you believe some foods can be, can cause inflammation yeah. that's leading to some sort of implantation <clears throat> failure or miscarriage? Yeah, I actually do. So, um, the Mediterranean diet has been proven clinically to improve your IVF success rates, uh, diets that are high in sugar diets that are high in cholesterol, um, diets that are high in uh, calories are all bad because they do increase your inflammation. Um, men with high cholesterol have terrible sperm. We see it all the time. Uh, diabetics have terrible sperm. Um, females with diabetes have a much harder time getting pregnant and staying pregnant. So inflammation in your body is never good. To reduce the inflammation, you want a very natural diet. You want a reasonable calorie diet. Like, you know, maintain your needs. Don't go above. Don't don't go under. Um, and, you know, you want basically the the stuff that's relatively healthy. Fruits, vegetables, grains, um, a little bit of dairy is probably reasonable. Um, if you're going to have meat, preferably fish. Um, and if you're having fish, preferably fish that's um, organic and has not been exposed to a ton of mercury. Uh, so that kind of thing will definitely be beneficial for you. Do you have any suggestions on foods either to avoid or a proponent of? Basically what I just said, um, skip sugar, skip cholesterol. Don't skip it, but minimize sugar and cholesterol. Follow the Mediterranean diet. Question you're going to love. Okay. In terms of surgery to remove endo, what is the difference between mm -hmm. ablation and ex excision? Excision. I've read that ablation can actually cause the endo to grow back worse. <laughs> um, so they. this is something we find on the internet all the time. And um, every once in a while, I get someone that's like this staunch excision advocate that comes in and says, I only want it excised. Okay. So there's zero difference. Um, not zero. It's a one point difference out of 100 on the clinical scoring system for this. And we actually reviewed this on the show probably two years ago now, um, where we reviewed a study that compared excision to ablation. There's basically no clinical difference whatsoever. As far as cautery uh, or ablation versus excision, um, it does in no way cause it to grow more. It actually isn't biologically possible to do that. The only difference is if it's deep endo, you can't always cauterize. You may have to remove it because you might be near a delicate area uh, or vice versa. And if it's superficial endo, you don't really need to remove it necessarily because it's much easier to cauterize it. Um, again, it depends on who's operating, what they're doing, where it is in your body. Sometimes you can't remove tissue because it's just in too delicate an area, whether it's on a nerve or on the bowel or you can't remove bowel tissue. You're going to have to get a colostomy after that. So um, unless you have bowel resection during the surgery. So endo is a very peculiar disease. So both methods are reasonable. Um, I use a combination when it's deeper or it's amenable to removal. I'll remove it um, when it's not so deep and it's just superficial. It's a tiny spot. You don't need to remove that. You can just burn it. And you'll get the exact same result. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, what are the supplements and uh, dosages you suggest for controlling endo? Uh, coenzyme Q10 has been shown to be effective, so that's 600 a day. NAC, which is usually 1,000 to 1,200 a day, that's N acetylcysteine. And um, uh, uh, curcumin powder. Um, and the one we use, I think, is 60 milligrams. So um, it's called Theracumin. Um, so that's the one we use, but it comes as a 60 milligram tablet. Do you recommend going on a gluten and dairy free diet ahead of FET and also after? <clears throat> if yes, when after a FET can I eat gluten and dairy again? Uh, I don't. You, you can do it if you're gluten and dairy sensitive, but not if you're not. It, it's not going to, you know, if gluten and dairy were preventing people from getting pregnant, we wouldn't have children in the world, right? Like, uh, I mean, Obviously, the world, the vast majority of the world's cultures consume gluten products and dairy. Um, so that kind of thing just is illogical to say you need to stop this. There, I know that there are certain 
um, groups of healthcare allied individuals who will say stop all dairy and stop all gluten. Um, you know, sure, if you have inflammation in your body already, it might be reasonable to do so. If you don't have active or known inflammation or you haven't failed a fertility cycle before, I don't see what the value of doing that is because it just doesn't make logical sense to abandon all of that. And if anything, your body kind of gets used to being at a certain level. And when you make drastic changes, it's not always a good thing. Um, so I would actually advocate for being judicious about that kind of thing. Is intermittent fasting safe to combine with healthy diet and exercise before an FEP? Um, it is if you're overweight. In fact, it's been shown to be very beneficial, but not if you're not overweight. So if you're overweight, you're trying to lose weight, intermittent fasting is helpful. If you are not overweight, it's probably not a prudent thing to do. <clears throat> Two IVF cycles, 32 eggs between both cycles. Awesome. Ended up with one embryo at the end of each cycle. Wow. Day six, five AA, day That's seven, five BB, both normal. Doctor thinks I have a genetic issue, missing protein, and then PRP for egg quality. PRP will in no way impact your egg quality. So please don't do that in the hopes that it will. That would be an epic waste of your time and money. Um, if the doctor thinks you have a genetic issue, he should be exploring your genetics um, and they should definitely check your partner. If either of you smoke, drink or use drugs, that's gotta go. Um, if his sperm quality is not great, that's a problem. If his DNA fragmentation is high, that's a problem. If either of you have weight as an issue, that's a problem. Um, so I would um, definitely find a physician that's really going to look into that in great detail. Um, PRP will not help you in that circumstance. Not at all. I agree that there's definitely something wrong, um, but figuring out what's wrong is critical. So you need to do that very carefully before you go ahead. Yeah. In 2017, my first IVF was successful. Since then, I've had four failed transfers, some transfers with euploid embryos. Wow. I've tried infrared lipids, no success. Can a multiple immune treatment be combined? Yeah, um, you can combine things. So we have patients that are on, um, for example, steroids and subcutaneous Ig. Um, we have patients that are on aspirin, heparin, steroids, intralipids. Um, I'll probably put people on combination of things with the uh, uh, tacrolim or not tacrolimus, the uh, serolimus. So. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of different things that can be tried for sure. Yeah, and they can be used in combination to good effect. How many mature follicles help make an IOI most successful? One, two, three, or four? Um, one and two have the same yield of uh, outcome. But when you go above two, you have a much higher risk of having twins and triplets four is an even higher risk of having triplets. So we strongly advise patients to be cautious. Um, we actually start draining your eggs out if you have more than three or we cancel your cycle now because of the risk of having high order multiples. So don't go for four. Only if you're older, if you're like 38, 39, sure, I can understand it then. But for anyone younger um, than like, let's say 35, um, even 38, uh, I would probably advise a maximum of three follicles. That's a great question. We haven't been asked that in forever, if at all. What are your thoughts on medication prednisone uh, <clears throat> as part of an FET cycle? How long do patients have to take this medication? Any chances? Um, what? Yeah. Any concerns? Um, so we use prednisone all the time. Um, the data on prednisone alone is not really all that convincing and there have been good trials done. So it does not look like prednisone alone makes a difference. So prednisone in combination with other things may, but prednisone alone does not change things. So prednisone with intralipids, prednisone with aspirin, prednisone with heparin, maybe some of these other things we've talked about tonight, that may make a difference. But prednisone by itself, um, there's pretty convincing data that is not helpful by itself. We typically use 25 milligrams a day and we'll continue that till they're 
12 weeks and then we stop. And you got to wean off. Don't just stop cold turkey. You'll go crazy. Are there any risks with trying Creolimus during a natural cycle? No, there's no risks. Would a normally healthy person have these immune issues? No seasonal allergies, etc. Yeah, you can be the healthiest person and have these immune issues all the time. Um, we see patients with it, even though we had no idea that they had it. So yes, it's very possible to have uh, reproductive immunological issues without you knowing that you have them at all. You can be healthy, eating well, exercising, all those stuff, all those things, and still have a, an overactive immune system. If anything, arguably, people that are super healthy and don't get sick very often may have these problems more often because their immune system is that much more reactive. After two, you employed embryo failures during medicated FETs. Would silent endometriosis be causing it? I understand that endo occurs outside of the uterus, so I'm confused as to how this would be an issue for a transfer. Um, could it be? Yes. Um, keep in mind that about half, almost half, 40 to 50% of the cases of endo are silent. Um, I'm not going to say that's what's causing it for you. I don't know, but it certainly could be. Um, how does it impact things? So uh, endo activates your immune system um, and it overactivates your immune system because your immune system recognizes that the endometrial cells are in the wrong place. And so they're attacking everything in your pelvis to get rid of it, which is why there's so much adhesion and pain and all of that. Um, so an overactive immune system in your pelvis is not going to discriminate and say, oh, I'm only attacking this one little speck of endo. It's going to attack everything in sight. That includes your uterus and your embryo that goes into your uterus. The immune system in your uterus is overactive when you have endo. So it's much more hostile to the embryo, and that's how it decreases the chances of success. What is the benefit of letrozole for a modified natural FET? Reduces your exposure to estrogen, increases your success rate, decreases inflammation. Um, we've reviewed that on the show before. God, that was probably a year and a bit ago when we did that. Um, so search through our letrozole. Um, uh, we have a couple on letrozole, but there's one on letrozole uh, specifically for frozen embryo transfers. And um, it was very clear that it significantly improved the success rate. And actually, that's what made us switch over to using letrozole for our embryo transfers. So, um, yeah, it works really, really well. And uh, with some luck, you don't need estrogen. And the less estrogen you use, the better off you are. Um, what are the effects of low estrogen on fertility and pregnancy if all hormone levels are normal? Um, well, it depends, I guess, on why your estrogen is low. If you're too slim, it can have a negative impact. If your ovaries are very weak, it can have a negative impact. But under normal circumstances, virtually no one pays attention to your estrogen levels unless they're really low or really high as the result of something else like your weight or um, a tumor or whatever the case is. <clears throat> Can the male genetic contribution to an euploid embryo affect transfer? Meaning, if I, husband, have allergies, etc., could that be an issue? Your husband's immunoreactivity should not play a role in the acceptance of your embryo. Although we do know that ejaculate needs to be in the vagina frequently prior to embryo implantation to improve success rates because they just released a study not too long ago, about a month ago or so, a month and a half ago, that demonstrated that the ejaculate actually primes the endometrium to accept an embryo. So that can be important. Um, but his immune reactivity should not impact your embryo implanting. Hi, Dr. Victory. I watched your show <clears throat> about C-sections and IVF. Oh, yeah. I have two previous C-sections and saw my chances with IVF will be lower uh -huh. due to scar tissue. Could the embryo implant on the scar and cause issues? How yes. long should I wait after my last C-section to do an FED? Thanks. Um, well, if you're planning on having a vaginal delivery, well, you've had two C-sections, so don't plan on a vaginal delivery. Skip that. 
So if you're planning uh, <clears throat> to just have another one, um, if you're breastfeeding, wait a minimum of six months. Um, I'd probably recommend somewhere between six months to a year anyways. It's a minimum of three months, but six months really should be the baseline. Um, and then as far as implanting in the scar, yes, it's called a cesarean ectopic pregnancy. It's actually fairly common and it is not good because um, it can really do a lot of damage to the uterus and it's quite dangerous because of the hemorrhage risk. So um, yeah, they're very serious and they need to be dealt with. I actually had one not that long ago. Um, and uh, yeah, you need to be very, very cautious. Having said that, it would be very uncommon in IVF to have an embryo implant at the C-section scar because we are intentionally implanting the embryo way north of the scar. Um, you know, it should be about three quarters of a centimeter to one and a half centimeters from the top of the uterus. That's where you're aiming for. So there's no reason to be putting it low down where the C-section scar would be. In fact, that would be idiotic. I had an SIS done today at your clinic and discovered one of my tubes is blocked. I'm 30 and have hypothyroidism. Okay. What should my next steps be? Um, well, to hang on until we finished all your testing and talk to me. Um, your tube may not have been blocked. Just because they couldn't see that it was open does not mean that it was blocked. Um, it may be that your tube um, was in spasm um, or preferentially the other one was open because it was getting ready for an egg. Um, typically, if you don't have a history for a blocked tube, I'm not convinced that your tubes are blocked until um, you know we see it on either a hysterosalpingogram or at the time of surgery. Um, but your hypothyroidism needs to be treated um, and we can certainly monitor you to make sure the egg you're producing is on the other side. But I need the rest of your tests. I need to know what all your hormones are like, your vitamin levels are like. I need to know what your partner is like because we don't go ahead till we have the full picture. Um, I don't do things like everybody else does. Most places just want your money. So they just kind of railroad you through, say, hey, go do three IUI. I don't do that. Like I want to know what's wrong and then I want to fix it because we actually have tons of patients that get pregnant um, from just listening to what we say. I mean, every week I have a bunch of people telling us on Instagram or Facebook or uh, even YouTube that they got pregnant just watching the show. Um, I have one lady who was the friend of a local physician who contacted me and I did a consult with them and they had already tried IVF and it didn't work. They were about to try again. And I went through all of her history and I was like, well, your prolactin's high. You need your prolactin adjusted. So we adjusted her prolactin. She got pregnant naturally the next month. She's about to deliver. Um, so, you know, those sorts of stories are the ones that I'm actually most excited about because I, Honestly, I really don't want everybody doing IVF. Um, I want people to just succeed with as minimal interference and help from us as possible. Um, so yeah, I mean, if we can do something simple to get you pregnant, that's the way to go. And so that's typically the way we, we aim for it. We wanna know everything about you so that we are not jumping into treatment um, without knowing what's actually wrong. Because sometimes I don't need to do any treatment for you other than change your vitamins or change your habits or something like that. So um, I can't tell you yet what you need to do specifically um, until I have your full picture, but I promise you we will give you all of the appropriate options for you when we meet to do what we call your I-1, which is your first visit after you've completed all your testing. You're almost there. You just need to do your day 23 progesterone probably. Um, and if you already did that last month, then that's fine. Just let the office know you've done all your testing and we'll set up the follow-up. I have endometriosis, and my last laparoscopy was seven years ago. Should I be asking for another one to be done? Um, if you're trying to get pregnant, yes. If you are not trying to get pregnant, you can control it with medicine. So as long as you're not in pain or debilitated in some way, um, then no, you don't need it. You can just do it with either nothing if you're not bothered by it or take medications because there's good meds for, uh, for endometriosis. Hey, Dr. V. Hey. 41 years old. Okay. First cycle failed due to poor response. Scheduled with birth control, 325 gonolef, 75 manicure. November cycle, estrus priming for 100, gonol 75 manicure. How does this sound? 
I don't need to feel like Tarek's. Yeah. That's my initial okay. Yeah. There you go. Tarek's become. You know what? If I'm ever not here, Tarek could probably answer most of your questions by now. Um, okay. So uh, birth control for someone with weak ovaries is always a mistake. You should not do that. It doesn't work. So I would do a natural start. Um, estrogen priming is fine. Um, whether you use DHEA, testosterone, estrogen, it doesn't make a difference. They all have basically the same outcome. But you definitely can try an estrogen prime cycle. Um, as far as your dose, um, everyone will probably argue about this forever. Um, they have done studies that show that there is no significant difference between um, medium doses of gonadotropins and high. So medium being kind of like 300 and high being higher than 300. Um, we do go over that sometimes if I'm really convinced I need to, you know, pound the patient with medications to get their ovaries to respond. But we try not to, um, generally speaking. And as far as the ratio, it should always be half, half urinary to synthetic. So gonalef is a synthetic and menopure is a urinary. So rather than 225, 75 or 375, it should be like, you know, 225, 225 or 150, 150 or whatever the number is. Um, so that will give you a better outcome than um, doing uh, one third, two thirds ratio. <clears throat> see, Tarek knew. He's pointing, he's going, see, I knew. <laughs> How soon after myomectomy and hysteroscopy with an endometrial biopsy, do you recommend to do a frozen transfer? Um, at least a month or two. So you need to have the fibroid removed, wait at least one period, repeat your saline infusions on a histogram, make sure it's normal, and then get ready for your FET. If I have endometriosis, am I... It's the endo talk today, eh? like We got a lot of endo people out there. Endo. Maybe we got to go back to endo. You know what I noticed, actually? On our YouTube channel, we have a video on natural endometriosis treatments. I think we just went over, is that a 10 or 11,000 oh, views? That. that one's creeping up. It's creeping up. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot of people have watched that one, yeah. So, uh, again, if I have endometriosis, yep. and my last lap, laparoso laparoscopy was about seven years ago. That's the same person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I think people uh, want their question answered like now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, more. <laughs> there, there's all people like asking questions. So we will answer. Just hang in and we'll we'll get to you. I promise. Okay. I think we need a disclaimer at the show. At the start of the show, your questions will get answered. Just be patient. Yeah. yeah. Besides baby aspirin and reducing sugar intake, is there anything I can do to reduce any inflammation prior to an mm -hmm. FET this month? Oh, God. Yeah. Uh, loads of vitamins, um, low calorie diet, exercise nonstop. Acupuncture, yoga. Um, uh, I think that's probably it. Yeah, those would be the main things. Does DOR mean you will always have poor embryo quality? No. Um, I have a patient who I'm currently treating who has very severe DOR, who only made one egg, and we got a genetically normal euploid embryo, the very first try. And then we just did another cycle and we are not getting the same result. So it can be very hit and miss. Sometimes you will have a great result. Sometimes you will not. Um, by no means does DOR mean you will always have poor embryo quality. It means it'll be harder to get a good embryo, but it does not mean that all your embryos will be bad. Is it normal for day three FSH to shoot up after egg retrieval? No. In fact, if anything, it should be really low because your estrogen level might still be going down. Um, but I wouldn't put any faith into your day three FSH level after an egg retrieval because well, I'm not even sure why they're testing you for that. So don't worry about it. Wait for your next cycle and see what that shows. <clears throat> I hear you recommend fertilis. Yeah, it's, it's full cycle. Pre it's coming in. Yeah, 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 yeah. How do you go about getting this done? Does it need to be ordered by your fertility doctor? No, you can order directly. We we help all our patients with fertilisis, but we don't upcharge for any of the stuff we do with them. You're already being charged enough. I don't need to make money on people that are struggling to get pregnant. So um, yeah, just uh, contact fertilisis directly. They're actually quite good about getting back to people. 
Um, and all you need to do is order the test directly from them. They'll ship it to you. You ship it back. They send you the results. And then you share them with your doc. Is CoQ10 okay to take leading up to FDT? Yes. There's nothing wrong with taking it leading up to, continuing on, and going on, you know, even past that. Um, you're chock full of CoQ10. You need it for your mitochondria. So taking it even throughout pregnancy has no detrimental effects. How do you find out you have a problem with your immune system? Good question. So you have to do insanely expensive testing, which is really annoying and I hate that. Um, the cheapest place I have found is Fertilisys. Um, I do not promote Fertilisys for the sake of promoting Fertilisys. I have no financial relationship with them at all. Um, I wish I did based on their growth, but um, I think we're probably instrumental in helping them grow. Uh, so anyways, um, but they are cheaper, uh, places in the U S like the Allen beers lab was charging like 3000 us to get the testing done. Um, fertilis for us is coming down to 600 euros, which is about 850, 900 bucks Canadian, something around that neighborhood, maybe a little bit more. So, uh, yeah, that's what we use. And they have a whole panel. When do you test for reproductive immunology issues? Um, if you have signs or symptoms of an overactive immune system, for example, if you have a, um, a immunological problem yourself, like rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, um, anything with inflammation or immunological, you know, uh, uh, basis. Uh, if you've failed euploid embryo transfers or even multiple embryo transfers, if you've had recurrent miscarriages. Um, we don't do immune testing for everybody. It's actually cheaper in many instances to treat people than to test them. So in some cases, we just treat you without knowing whether or not you have the condition. Um, but in other cases, we will test for it, especially if we have patients that want the answer to what's going on. Hi. Hi. I have had chemicals and an eight-week miscarriage. Okay. I recently had blood work done. And it found that my human transforming growth factor beta, THFE1, yeah. was 7,400. Could this be affecting my transfers? Um, transforming growth factor beta has a huge impact on your immunological function. I don't know the normal levels in the human body, um, but if that level is high, it's definitely going to have a negative impact. So that's something you would have to explore further to see what the normal serum levels of TGF beta are. Um, I don't know those numbers off the top of my head. Um, I'm sure we could find out for you. Do you recommend birth control or Lupron for endo before FET? I react pretty bad with any hormonal birth control, extremely low libido intercourse once two months, once two times a month. Ooh. Uh, Lupron and Letrozole, it will also affect your libido quite severely, but that's the only one that has proof that it actually benefits. Birth control will not provide you adequate endosuppression to provide a benefit in terms of your embryo transfer. Going for my day 21 Lupron shot this week for my FET next cycle. Yay. Is there a risk to getting this shot if I somehow miraculously conceived naturally this month? Um, it probably would not be a great idea. Um, so you should delay, um, don't have unprotected intercourse leading up to your, um, your cycle. Uh, having said that our patients that are getting pregnant are on Lupron. So, um, it's probably not a huge issue, but I wouldn't do it if you knew you were pregnant, um, cause it will suppress some hormones in you. So you can supplement those. You would just need to take estrogen and progesterone. But what, be cautious. What is a histro cell pain blueprint? We take you to a place that does x-ray. We put a speculum inside the vagina, gently open. Um, we connect some type of device to your cervix um, to allow flushing in a radio opaque dye, meaning dye that will show up on the x-ray. We gently flush and then it's a running x-ray, which is called fluoroscopy. Um, so it's like continuous x-ray so we can see in real time what's happening. You inject in the dye and then you watch to see if it goes out the fallopian tubes. 
How many cycles after a BMC would you suggest waiting? Can you try right away? Any risk to taking trying right away? Um, the only risk is if there's infection, but if there's no infection, there may even be a benefit to trying right away because your uterus is stickier after a DNC. So it's a good time to, to do the DNC. Do we still have like 10 million questions? You're on fire today. It's on fire today. <laughs> the one night, you, they, they the one night you and I don't eat before the show. Oh, Rahim's coming on today. Uh, Tarek and I didn't eat before the show, so we should bring the food and just eat and answer the questions. <laughs> All right, go. Follow up on the FSA shooting. Yeah, after yeah, yeah, yeah. Retrieval. Okay, cool. The the say three FSH was checked three months. The day three. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. After egg retrieval, FSH was always around eight to nine over the past year. Um, so that would be indicative of potentially, you know, diminished ovarian reserve, potentially. Um, I would want to recheck your hormones, do your egg count, check your AMH, um, you know, do an antral follicle count on ultrasound to see what's going on. Do you recommend CoQ10? For natural fertility, 38 yep. years old, all tests are normal on yep. DHEA, AMH 12.7. I do. And if you watch our YouTube, that's another popular one. Didn't it hit 20? Mm, yeah. yeah, it's like 21,000 or something. Yeah. Um, there's one that says CoQ10, what they don't want you to know. Um, so watch that video. It talks about all the benefits of CoQ10 and fertility. Um, it's huge. So yes, uh, everyone can take CoQ10. It's safe, it's harmless, and it's beneficial. Hey, Dr. V. Hey. Hope you're well. On day four of Letrozole, experiencing painful swollen lymph nodes and growing out of nowhere, possibly related? Um, highly unlikely. Um, that sounds more like you're about to break out in something, um, typically herpes, to be honest. So um, I would hold off uh, on doing anything until it manifests itself. Um, we haven't had people complain of lymph node swelling um, with Letrozole. Uh, I've never even seen that as a side effect, but, um, you know, I, I never say never. So anything's possible. I have immune DZ Wagner's. Okay. I've had two miscarriages and one trisomy 18 termination. Oh. All my tests for immune, uh, immune repro concerns have come back negative. Huh. What would you do for further pregnancies? Well, if you've got Wagner's, you're probably on all sorts of stuff, but that's a situation where you're looking at blood flow issues because Wagner's is a vas vasculitis. Um, so I'd probably be on heparin, aspirin, you know, pretty high dose steroids. Um, you might want to look at some of these other things like sirolimus, um, you know, uh, whether it's IVIG or subcutaneous IG. Um, those would all be really reasonable things to consider in a situation like that. That's going to be a very, very highly inflamed um, system, regardless of what your tests show. Um, and vasculitis is never embryo friendly. Um, so you want to keep those blood vessels and blood flow as strong as possible. So aspirin and heparin are the mainstays of that, but don't do it unless you've reviewed it with your rheumatologist first. Nine o'clock. Are we still on fire? Is it nine o'clock on fire or is it just nine o'clock? <laughs> it's just nine o'clock. Just you want to, random, should, we, random update should we give them 10 minutes? I'm starving. Yeah, I, know, well, I know you're starving too. I'm, I'm, Tarek's about to fall down, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to need to. Yeah. In my defense, I cut some slices of apple for him. Yeah. You're sick. yeah. Oh, All right. Um, you deserve to have to crawl around on the floor. <laughs> to keep my uh, incognito mode. Um, All right. You know, uh, I think something happened on Instagram. We're going to get some questions. Let them know what's up. Uh, you know what? We we may not have gotten all your questions on Instagram. Um, we're not sure why. Something weird yeah. is going on. The internet's it's weird because, tonight. Yeah, it's weird tonight. It seems like there's a lag in the time gap. So if there's anyone that has. Yeah, if you still have questions, go ahead. I want to see you. Okay. Do you have I want a, to see you too. Do you have a clinic in Brampton slash Mississauga? I used to, but I don't anymore. Um, but 
you know what? Virtual is the way to go these days. So we'll just see you virtually. And then if we need to treat you, um, we can get you treated anywhere you want. Um, I got patients, like I said, Australia, Thailand, um, Thailand's probably the far farthest. I have one in Japan. Um, you know, most of Europe, uh, Israel, we have patients coming to us from all over the world, um, Nigeria. Uh, so don't hesitate. Did your phone just like die? Magically die. Well, it just like magically it. died. <laughs> That's not good. Give me your phone. Uh, I am going to give you my phone. Uh, white news is limited to my nose and had a natural pregnancy on nothing. I don't know if you'll be able to find it there, but you could try. Um, yeah, I would, it, Wagner's being limited to your nose, um, you still probably have some degree of systemic inflammation. Yeah, so I'd still be cautious. <laughs> Hi there, trying again. Is there any downside to taking myonositol, suspected PCO rather than PCOS? No apparent insulin resistance, thanks. PCO rather than PCOS? No, there's no downside to taking uh, D Cairo or myo inositol, and you should take both. <clears throat> there, there was a question before it shut off, obviously. Oh, no. So I don't know. Uh, if you had an Insta Instagram, had some kind of meltdown. So if you uh, if you had an important Instagram question, just ask again, please. We will answer. Is there anything on that one? Or was that, no, was no, that it? That, uh, that PCO, PCOS one. Okay. Oh, try again. Okay. Should we try letrozole and IUI after two failed IUIs with gonolef? No. So gonolef is much stronger than letrozole. Um, so uh, letrozole and IUI will give you somewhere between a 10 to 15% chance of success. Gonolef and, um, and uh, IUI will give you about a 20 to 25% chance. So you would literally be going backwards. Um, you can try depending on your age, um, up to three more cycles. Um, or you could try one more cycle uh, if you're older. Um, and if that doesn't work, you should be looking at IVF. Does a high FSH have anything to do with my response to IVF meds or embryo quality? Totally. Absolutely it does. Yes, because a high FSH is indicative of how well your ovaries are functioning. So women with a high um, FSH do not do well. Um, typically. Uh, and so um, it will be indicative of your embryo quality, the number of eggs that you will make, the number of embryos that you will make, and even their genetic normalcy. So all of those things have to be factored into the math of what you're going to achieve. Tested positive for urea plasma. Okay. Treating it. Good. Any chances of it coming back after treatment? Frequently, if you don't treat your partner as well. Um, and uh, getting rid of urea plasma is the bane of my existence. It doesn't always go away, and sometimes it's extremely difficult to get rid of it. So, um, yeah, check, double check, triple check. Get your partner treated as well. I think we're going to end it on this <clears throat> comment. On this comment. All right, we're going to end it on this comment. No questions here, but just want to say I'm so excited to start working with you. Oh, awesome. Having a doctor who cares so much means everything. So thank you, big heart. Oh, thank you. Tarek's going big heart. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you very much. Um, you know what? We love what we do. Uh, Tarek loves it so much. He's become kind of a junior MD without ever going to med school. And um, you know what? We love helping people. So uh, that's what it's about for us and our whole team. Uh, and we're really, really honored to get the chance to help all of you guys out there. It's uh, it's a joy. It's a privilege. And we're really happy to do it. So uh, until next week, um, I don't think we have a topic for next week. Okay, I'm going to make you guys, let's put up a poll. That's what we should do. Let's put up a poll and say, send us the topics you want for next week. So you know what? We'll put up like an Instagram poll and um, we'll uh, get you guys to uh, jump on and, and tell us you know, out of a couple of different topics, what you want, or even suggest some topics. Um, and that way, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pick a couple and let them pick. And let them pick That's a good poll. an engagement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. We'll put up a couple of topics and we'll see what we can find. Um, and then we'll go from there. Maybe we'll look at the Cyril Lemus data. That'd be kind of cool. All right, guys, have a great night. Uh, Tarek and I are going to go fill our tummies now. And uh, you guys take care. See you next week on Fertility Fest.